Bacano, part number P184, Cabin Deck, from the 1930s aeroplane constructor set. Hi folks, and welcome back. History is a wonderful thing at times. So many lost stories are waiting to be listened to again. But also, there's a side to history that shows us what we did wrong. And from those lessons, we should be able to learn and do better. But history repeats itself all too often. Take the Second World War. That happened due to the events at the end of the First World War. The revenge that France inflicted on the Germans at the end of the conflict in 1918 were in no small part due to the revenge of, of Germany on France at the end of the Franco-Prussian War some 40 years before. That event was revenge for how the French had treated the Prussians during the Napoleonic Wars of 1803 to 1805. And I've just oversimplified it. There was a lot more going on than that. But have you ever wondered why Germany was rebuilt in the 1950s? Why we pushed so hard to have peace in Europe. Just look at that history. Nearly 150 years of warfare coming down to revenge. The waste of life, not just human, but our ecosystem as well. Don't worry, I'm not about to go on a rant about global warming, etc. This is about history. There is a teaching in the Bible that got me thinking one day. The sins of the father are visited unto the son until the fourth generation. That's 80 years. And so often with history, you see that time frame playing out with history repeating itself. And while this build was a great model and one that I really enjoyed making, the history behind the gunboat and the role it's played in our history is not one of our finest moments. And I wonder if that's what Akana was wanting when it chose this model. Was it hoping to break the 80 year cycle that history repeats? Because if we're not careful, as each generation chooses to react with aggression, then the cycle will never be broken. As it takes that four generational gap to heal the damage done in the first case. And don't worry, again, this script is not lecturing us on what our grandparents or great-grandparents got wrong. It's just when I was researching this subject and planning the script, it got me thinking about the world we live in and the geopolitics that we see played out every day. And how they might affect us on a personal level, even though we can't do anything about them. Maybe we should first look at what a gunboat is, and where they came from, and their purpose in any navy. The gunboat is, from my research, a Swedish invention created by Frederick Henrik Aff Chapman, the son of an English naval officer whose maternal grandfather was a London shipwright. Chapman was the first person to apply scientific methods to shipbuilding, Without his work in the 18th century, the Cutty Shark would never have made her tea runs in the 19th century. His history is rather chequered. He spent a lot of time abroad to further his education. He was arrested in England in 1753, having written several papers documenting English shipbuilding techniques at the time. His charges were not that of spying, but of attempting to lure skilled shipwrights away to either French service or other countries. He was placed under house arrest for around a month, at a cost of half a guinea a day, or about £60 a day in modern money, which he had to pay himself. After his release, his papers were returned to him, and he went on to study under Thomas Simpson, an English professor of mathematics. He then travelled to the Netherlands and learnt from them. 
then to France, and you get the idea. The French were really keen to recruit him for the French Navy as a ship designer. Then finally, in 1756, he returned to England, and again at the Admiralty, worked hard to encourage him to work for them, and again he declined. In 1757 he found a backer in the form of King Gustav III of Sweden. And it's here that Chapman would thrive to become the chief shipwright of the Royal Docklands at Karlskrona. Using physics, which he'd learnt in England under Thomas Simpson, to understand how ships behaved in water, he designed and had built a 100 metre long pool to test the hydrodynamic features of scale models, a test still carried out today in major shipyards. He had discovered in France that the best size of fast ship was around 60 guns, giving both hitting power and speed. That trade-off was to be a problem well into the 20th century. And in his work he hit upon the idea of the gunboat, a small vessel with, with around a crew of 50, manning one or two heavy calibre cannon, and with a shallow draft. These boats were fast, nimble craft, able to hit hard, but with little ability to soak up damage. But being small, they were hard to hit, fast to build, and able to operate in water depths that larger, better gunned ships could not. Sweden at the time had lost its position as a world power, heavily interfered with by England, France and Russia, all vying for power in the Baltic after the collapse of the Hanseatic League that had controlled all trade in the area up till the 17th century. Carl Gustav III intended to change this, viewing Russia as the most dangerous threat he sided with Britain. And as the world descended into conflict after the collapse of France during the revolution and the following wars, he chose to assist Britain in its wars against France. With Denmark controlling the entrance to the Baltic, the game was afoot to take control of the country. But they had learned from Sweden's research and development of the gunboat. For nearly seven years, a war was waged against the Royal Navy and Sweden by the Danish-Norwegian forces known as the Gunboat War. In this war, again and again, using hit and run tactics around small islands, the Danish Norwegian forces were able to best the more powerful Royal Navy. It's not until the Danish Navy starts to fight the Royal Navy on their own terms, in a standard battle of the line, that we see the results turn again in favour of the Royal Navy. It wasn't until 1813 when Sweden during the war, the Sixth Coalition invaded Holstein in northern Germany that the Danish-Norwegian forces were forced to surrender. At last, Norway was able to gain its freedom from Denmark after the Treaty of Kiel in 1814, which saw the Danish island of Helgoland being ceded to Britain for the better part of 80 years, and with it the control of the Baltic as the Royal Navy now had a base in which they could patrol from and control commerce in the area, of course, in a fair manner that allowed everybody to benefit, but Britain most of all. With the invention of the steam engine, the gunboat was to grow in size, and with it the ability of major powers to project the threat of force the world over. Two such examples of this are the Anglo-Zanzibar War and the Don Pacifico Affair. The Anglo-Zanzibar War is the shortest recorded war in history at around 38 minutes. I spent longer having my lunch today. This war is one of those moments of colonial control that 150 years ago seemed fine. But as we've learned from history, now know not to be so good. 
the very sudden death of the pro-British Sultan Hamad bin Brouwani on the 25th of August 1896. Hmm, I wonder what he died of. Followed by the immediate ascension of his cousin Khalid. I wonder if it was poison. Hmm, yes. Gave rise to the objections by the British government. The Treaty of 1890 where Zanzibar had become a British protectorate forbade the ascension of any sultan without the agreement of the British Crown. The treaty had allowed the British government to ostensibly permit the Royal Navy to enter German territorial waters off the coast of German-controlled East Africa because they were supporting a British ally. Sultan Khalib bin Bogash was definitely not pro-British. In fact, he was very pro-German. Leading, the, leading to the complaint from the British government, after all, they wanted Hammond bin Mohabban, who, who was pro-anti-slavery and pro-British, and a lot easier to control. Nothing like a puppet government doing what you want them to do. Britain issued a Cassius Belli, or a public justification to, to start a war. In this case, Khalid had not asked British permission to be Sultan. And on the 26th of August, the British government ordered Khalid to stand down in favour of Hammond. And he refused. The British fleet, consisting of two cruisers and three gunboats, opened fire on the 27th at 0900 hours East Africa time. And between 38 to 45 minutes later, having sunk the Zanzibar fleet, which was only one ship, Khalid's flag was struck from the palace. With around 500 Zambarians dead due to the shelling, I'm not surprised the completely outnumbered, under-equipped forces decided to surrender. After all, uh, they only had two field guns. And once a royal yacht was sunk, yes, that was the opposing navy, the options to fight didn't seem like a good idea. With a friendly government in power, the British now ruled over the island, and the former Sultan Khalid escaped to the German consulate on Zanzibar, and from there to German-controlled East Africa. The rule of gunboat diplomacy is still used today. After all, what the Chinese Navy is doing along the Seven Dash Line in the China Sea is nothing different to what the Europeans did 200 years ago. It's just now we don't like what's happening. Now that's food for thought, isn't it?